Can everybody grab a song book? Take their seat. We're going to turn to number three in the supplement. But before we start, before we start, grab, go ahead and grab your seat. We're going to do hey. things a little bit different today. And for some of you that are already talking, you might want to ask your partner in case you missed this. We're going to sing this three times. Number three, three times. The first time, it's going to be ladies only. The second time we sing this, it's going to be men only. The third time we sing it, it'll be the whole congregation. Amen. All right? Ladies first. Number three. For Brian. Number three.
start off tonight with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you, we praise you, Lord, for the love that you had towards us. You gave yourself, you gave your life to save us from our sins. And Lord, you, you made this free to all, and now, Lord, we want to get that message to all. So, Lord, we pray that you would move amongst us. We thank you for what you've done so far in this conference. We praise you. And Lord, we ask that you would give the preachers that are coming up now uh, just the freedom and need to speak freely and clearly, Lord, uh, that they would that they would preach your word with power, and that you would uh, move uh, freely with your spirit among us tonight. And we invite you to do this in our lives, Lord. We thank you, we praise you, we lift you up on high. Well, it has been a blessing, <laughs> and it has been a great pleasure to get to know. Joshua, uh, Kelly Sturge, and their family, their beautiful family, and the work that they are doing, and just the fellowship we have in the gospel, it really is great, and we, we love to know that we have other people that are that are in it with us, and it's really good to get to know y'all, and we appreciate all that y'all are doing. So, uh, Joshua, it's going to be your turn to speak, and I believe they have a special that they want to present to us also. Do you know how it feels to know something's missing? Hear a still, small voice you just keep dismissing. Do you know how it feels to be troubled inside? To think just for you on a cross, some wonder. How does it feel? Sins washed away, never to be remembered. Tell me, do you know how it feels? And how does it feel to know you're a child of the King? Your heavenly Father owns everything. How does it feel to know you are loved by the one who created the stars up above? How does it feel to know you're all right when you lay your head on your pillow each night and know that it's real? Tell me, do you know how it feels? Do you know how it feels when your cold heart is melting and the tears start flowing the moment you felt it? Do know how it feels wherever you roam you still get this feeling you're not at home knowing heaven is real tell me do you know how it feels and how does it feel to know you're a child of the king your heavenly father owns everything how does it feel to know you are loved by the one who created the stars up above how does it feel to know you're all right when you lay your head on your pillow each night and know that it's real tell me do you know how it feels Knowing heaven is real. Tell me, do you know how it feels? Amen. 
Well, thank you very much, family. It's what a blessing it is to be able to travel and uh, share the ministry that God has given us with them. And I know that my time is limited. One of the hardest things as a dad, uh, when you're at my age bracket and you start to realize that the oldest kid isn't seven anymore or 12 anymore. And as a, I was a youth pastor at our home church for about eight years, but worked with the teen ministry for around 17. And so I watched this happen in lives of my friends, brothers, and sisters of Christ from our church as they would have their children and they would get into the high school years and they'd be go, 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 go. And just like that, graduation, graduation, graduation. And they were gone. And uh, it was, it's been tough for me the last, the last couple months as I look in the rearview mirror as we're traveling across the country and I'm looking at all four of those kids and I realize that Caleb, this is the last couple months he's traveling with us. And you be in prayer for him as the Lord brings our family to mind. Caleb is surrendered to do whatever God would have him to do with his life. And uh, I don't know what God has in store for him, but uh, I'm excited to see what, uh, what God's going to do with him now. So, but let's get into the word tonight. I, uh, I'm excited to preach this message, and I hope and pray that the Lord uses it in your heart and life. Uh, it's been wonderful to be with you. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Brother Eddie pretty much stole the sermon, which is, is great. But, uh, but you guys have taken care of us so well. Thank you for the hotel. It has been great. I shared that with Pastor Brother Brent several times and said, hey, thank you for the accommodations. They've served our family extremely well. When you travel with six of you, it's not quite the same. I grew up with just one brother, as you saw on the slides uh, the other night. And uh, so it was easy for my parents. Two double beds, they got one, we got the other. Easy peasy. Um, but with our family, it's a little bit more complex. And uh, the accommodations have been great. The food has been awesome. I remember Claudia saying to me after spending the first week in Texas, the food down here is awesome. Y'all know how to cook food. That's all I can say. But Tex-Mex, we don't know what Tex-Mex is up in Wisconsin. Just say that. But, uh, but thank you for the food. Thank you most of all for the sweet, welcoming spirit and the fellowship that we've enjoyed. It has been a true blessing to our family. And uh, getting to know each one of you that I've had the opportunity to, I've been blessed and encouraged by you. The preaching has been a challenge to me, has been encouragement to me. There's been reproof, there's been exhort, exhortation, and I, I appreciate uh, the men in the spirit uh, that we've experienced here. So, But tonight I want to preach a message called Build There Upon. Build thereupon. Understand that in order for us to do what God has intended for us, we have to follow his map of building our lives. He's saved our souls. The problem with religion is religion has it backwards. Religion says you have to do, 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 do in order to go to heaven which is false. There is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The only hope that we have is the redeeming power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation offered through him. There's nothing we can do to merit, earn, or gain our salvation. But once we are saved, he expects us to work with the time that we have. And so... Me spending 24 years as a building uh, in residential construction, 20 of those years as, a, as an owner-operator of a business, when I was reading this passage one day, the building aspect really jumped out at me. And the Lord gave me this message, and I hope it's a challenge and a blessing to you. So let's start 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 and following. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. 
for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. Pay close attention. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, what a blessing, what a privilege it is, Lord, to gather together freely in your house we think of the countless uh, believers that meet in, in fear across this world, fear of somebody breaking through, fear of somebody breaking up their assembly, fear of somebody taking them off to jail. We thank you for the freedom that you've given us. But mostly, Lord, we thank you for the freedom of our souls that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. And I pray that in these few moments that we have tonight, God, that you would speak to us, challenge us through your word. Lord God, that you'd hide me behind the cross, that you'd be lifted up and glorified. And Lord, that we would follow your promptings in our hearts if there's areas that we need to, Lord, purge some things, get some things straightened around. And we'll give you the praise and the glory, and we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. I have four points tonight. The foundation the framing, the furnishings, and the final inspection. In my years spent with building houses, I became acutely aware of the process of building a house. Let's start with the foundation. Let's go to the center of this passage. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Boy, we've got builders. We have men in this church that are familiar with building. It goes without saying to you that the importance of the foundation cannot be overstressed. If you have a question on that, take a look. It was just, what, a month or two ago was the one-year anniversary of that giant apartment complex in Florida that collapsed, and uh, dozens and dozens of people lost their life, multiple injuries, and as they researched that, they found out that the foundation was faulty. And it was fine for a while. But what happened? Eventually, that faulty foundation was exposed and the building was compromised. As we look around this world today, whether it's in Mexico, whether it's in Poland, whether it's in, in San Antonio, across the United States, or to the uttermost, we see people building their lives on a shaky foundation, a faulty foundation. And that foundation is guaranteed to fail. Someday, if they don't get their life built on the right foundation, they will die lost in their sins and will go to hell. There is no other option. People look at us Lost people look at us as born-again believers, and they just go, oh, you guys, they, they look at us like we're bigots. You think you're the only ones that are right. No, we believe what the Bible says, and the Bible says that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ is it. Summer of 1982. I was traveling with my parents as a young man. We were at a Knights Inn motel. And those used to be scattered all across the mid part of this country. But I remember my parents in family devotions sharing once again the gospel message. And the Holy Spirit began to convict my heart. And I realized as a young man 
that I was a sinner and I was bound for hell and I needed a savior. I repented of my sin and I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be my savior right there beside that purple bedspread in Knights Inn in Columbus, Ohio. And in that moment, my eternal destiny changed. I wasn't saved because I was Don Sturtz's son. I wasn't saved because I attended such and such a church. I wasn't saved because I was a missionary kid. Those are crumbling foundations. I was saved because I believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, repented of my sins, and put my faith and my trust wholly in him. What about you? Sunday night crowd, we like to think that everyone is saved. But if your foundation is on anything else, if there's not a time where you can remember that the Holy Spirit convicted you of your sin, if there's never a time that you can remember where you put your faith and trust completely on him to save you, I challenge you, make sure of your foundation. Because everything else I say from here on forward is not going to do you any good as more than it would do any single person that's out there any good. They feel like the things I'm about to talk about are the things that earn them favor with God. But the Lord said in his word that all of those righteousnesses are as filthy rags in his sight. How do we compare to the spotless lamb of God and his precious blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary for you and me? There is no comparison. Do you know for sure that no matter what storms of life hit your soul, that your foundation is sure? Because someday there is a storm coming, and it is called physical death. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. This is the thing that this little puny brain, I cannot wrap my mind around. Because it's in God's word, I believe it with all of my heart. But once you or I die, we don't get another opportunity in this realm of the saving of our souls. The religion called Catholicism, it was so unimaginable for them that they had to create a place called purgatory. You say, how can you say that they've created it? Because it's not in here. There is no middle ground. There is no place that you can pray somebody out of or pay somebody out of. The payment has been made, but the choice for you and I has to be made while we are living in this body. Once you're translated and you see death, that's it. There's no, no going back. There's no do-over. There's no second chance. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. He is the one that we are to have our lives built upon. He is the one that we are to have our ministries built upon. He is the one that the church is built upon. We are not a social program, although sometimes we're involved with those things. We are not a humanitarian aid program. Although, sometimes, we're involved with those things. We are a ministry built upon the precious sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is our message, it is our imperative to share that gospel message with a lost and dying world around us, however the Lord leads us to do that. Whether that's passing out a gospel tract, whether that's street preaching on the corner, whether that's doing a campaign and giving people John and Gospels of John and Romans, whether that's sharing your testimony with your coworker, your lost relative, or your neighbor over the fence. How ironic that we can talk about the weather, we can argue about the property line, but when it comes to spiritual stuff, all of a sudden we get mum. We're not a humanitarian aid program. What does Ephesians 2.19 say? Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building 
fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Understand, all of this is built upon him. But now let's take a walk back, and let's go through a couple of these verses. What does it say in verse number 7? It says there, uh, as we go back to our text in 1 Corinthians 3, So then, neither is he that planteth at anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. I said it last night in the presentation. We are nothing but tools in God's hands. But you know what happens so often in our circles, even within our assemblies, within our churches? We get, there's pride that creeps into our heart, as has been addressed even today, where we get, well, I do this and they only do that, and therefore I'm more important. What did Jesus say to his apostles? Those of you that's going to be your chief, let him be what? Your servant. Your servant. This is the exact opposite of the hierarchy that we see in the world. They can't figure it out. They look at biblical Christianity, it just doesn't compute to them. But why should that be a surprise? They are of the world, they are of the earth. But sometimes what happens is, is that ideology creeps inside the walls of the church. And all of a sudden, we can't figure out why, are, why is the people biting and devouring one another? Because they think there's something. Instead of looking at the one who is all in all. And man, I've seen that. I've, we, some of the brethren, as we've talked this week, we've, we've agreed on the, the, the tension and the inability to work together. Let's focus on these differences. We have two differences, so let's spend our whole focus on that instead of the 99 ways that we are alike to share the gospel with the lost and dying. And then they look over at us going, what in the world? You guys are Christians, and you guys are Christians, and... Brethren, these things ought not so to be. Right. You know what? Brother Brian, I'm thinking, I'm glad my tools don't fight. Could you imagine if you went to your big tool chest, the back of your truck, the back of your van, everybody does it a little different. I had a job trailer. But you went in there, and, and you couldn't get the saw to do what it was supposed to do because it wanted to be the nail gun. And the nail gun didn't want to do what it was supposed to do because it, was, it wanted to be the measuring device. It wanted to be the square. It wanted to be the tape measure. And you're going, guys, 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 I've got a house to remodel. I've got a, I've got a house to build. And you guys are spending so much time fighting, you're not fit for the purpose that I need you for. Sometimes we, within the walls of these churches, we get so focused on everybody else's situation and what they're doing or what they're not doing that we're not doing what we're supposed to do. Now he that planteth, verse 8, and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. This first phrase, he that planteth and watereth are one. I'm not even going to belabor that. Because Brother Corey, I thought, felt, did a tremendous job talking about that, preaching about that this morning. But understand, there is a partnership that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God that we get to work together to see souls saved, to see lives change for eternity through his power and might. But notice the second part of this verse. Every man shall receive his own reward, or his re own reward according to his own labor. Just because you come to church doesn't mean that you're fulfilling the purpose God has for you right here in this assembly. As has been stated over and over again this week, search your own heart. Is there something God wants you to do? Now that may mean going on one of these trips coming up this next year, whether to Mexico or to Gdansk. But it may mean that there's something for you to do right here. And I promise you, if the Lord's been working on your heart and you come and talk to one of the pastors, they're not going to say, nope, we got all the bases covered. I think you should just keep warming that seat. <laughs> they're going to be excited. They're going to be excited to plug you in, to, 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 to have you step into the harness with them. Because someday, and we're going to get to this point in a few minutes, someday there will be a final inspection. And at that day, 
you didn't get to go up with all of the folks from the assembly. We're all going to go up together, and we're going we're to be there together, and we're going to get the, this time of reckoning together. So then every one of us shall give account of himself. I love this verse, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Let that soak in for a minute. What? Josh Sturtz, the framer, the builder, he gets to be a co-laborer with God? Don Sturtz, the, the former dairy farmer, Larry Ingalls was... A, also with our ministry, was a bartender before he got saved. We get to be co-laborers together with God? As I was thinking about this, a story came to mind. Back about 13 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, we decided to plant a little orchard in our backyard. Four apple trees. And I tried my best, failed sometimes, but tried my best to include my kids in whatever projects I was doing and get them hands-on experience. I knew I could do it faster a lot of times by myself, probably do a better job, but I knew that it was beneficial for them and I loved the experience of working with my children. So we got out our four apple trees and we had our, our Harold Red and our two Honeycrisp and our Red Baron, and we spaced them all out, which we thought was a really good distance back then. Now that they're much larger, <laughs> I should have probably put them further apart. But we laid them all out, and we stood them up, and I still remember Caleb and Claudia. Judge wasn't born yet, I don't think. No, he wasn't. And Caleb and Claudia stand there, and Caleb with his little face, as I'm asking him, do those look like they're in a straight line? And he's like, Move that one a little bit, Dad. So we got them a little bit adjusted, got them all set. And then I took the spade and I went around and marked the outside edge of the root ball. And then we got them out of the way. And I'm shoveling with my big uh, shovel and spade. And there's Caleb and Claudia with their little plastic shovels that are kind of bending over every time they put them in the dirt. And then they would flick out a little, like maybe a tablespoon full of soil. <laughs> you know, and they're like, Dad, I got some. I'm like, yes, you did. Yes, you did. This is great. And so we're working together, and we get it. We get the first one done. And then I go, okay, Caleb, I need your help now, buddy. And he's like, okay, Dad, what can I do? What can I do? And I said, you grab that side, and I'll grab this side. No, you guys know uh, an apple tree that's probably, I'm going to say six feet tall, that's got a root base, that's probably, root ball is probably that big. I don't know what those weigh, 75, 100 pounds. And so I grab a hold of it, and he grabs a hold of it, and he goes, Aah! like that. And I picked it up, and we moved it over and got it right beside the hole. And then I broke off the outside. And I said, OK, Caleb, help me pick it up again. And he's, Aah! and we set it down in there, and we got it put and tamped. And after we got it tied off, he looks at me. He's going like this. And he says, Dad, we make a good team, don't we? said, Caleb, we make a good team. He said, Dad, we work together well, don't we? And I said, Caleb, we work together well. And then I thought of my heavenly father. And he chooses me to be on his team. And he said, here, Josh, go ahead and grab a hold of this. And I grab a hold of it. I can't budge it, but I'm willing. And he says, okay. And he does all the work. But when it's done, he says, we make a good team. You're a fellow laborer with me. Isn't it amazing, God, we serve? I told you guys last night, we've heard it from the missionaries. We've heard it from the pastors. This work is his work. We are just blessed to be part of it. Praise God. So now the framing. We've got the foundation. Verse 10 says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth 
thereupon. What are we doing in our personal lives? If we've received the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have got the only foundation that will last for eternity. But guess what? There's a foundation, but now there's some building that needs to take place. And the Lord looks at us through his word and says, take heed how you're building thereon. I'm looking at, at uh, my experience with construction. And I look at those foundations we pull up, and only a builder would know what it's like to pull up, and you've got your lumber pile that's there, your floor joist material if you're building over a basement. I know down here you don't do that often. But if, if, you've, got a, if you've got a slab foundation, and you've got your wall material there, and that pile of lumber is there, and that, and that cr uh, pallet of fasteners is there, and you've got your tools, and you go, okay, it's time to get to work. We want to see this thing go vertical. And boy, there's hardly a more exciting day on a job site as a framer to see those walls go up. You know, in a, up in the North Country where we've got the basements and you put the, wall, the floor on, that is necessary. But it doesn't, it's not exciting for the customer. But once the walls go up, whoa, look at this, something's getting done. And then you get to the, the roof system. Up by us, we generally use trusses, did some hand framing of different roofs, but when you start doing the roof system, you're getting that shape. They can see what the house is going to look like. And we would have a good day setting trusses, set trusses and have half the roof sheeted. And the customers would come in and they'd be singing our praises like, like, we, like we conquered this, you know, Mount Kilimanjaro or something. And, uh, and in our minds, we didn't tell them, but in our minds were going, we had a lot more work doing the floor system. But my point is, there's something exciting about building thereupon in construction. What about in our personal walk with the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you excited to build thereupon? Are you excited to frame up? Are you excited to continue the framing? There's stages, there's things that have to happen. And if they're not done right, it's going to be a problem. I was building a house. One of the things that is, again, with my years in framing, that was absolutely important to me was good quality material. Because it is hard to make something look good, no matter what your skill set is, if the material is poor. And so studs for your exterior walls, interior walls. Man, we'd get into some of these bunks, and you'd start looking through them. We called them banana wood. I mean, they were, they were twisted. They were crowned. They were bowed. And so I'd set those aside. I want to use the good stuff. And I had one particular batch of studs one time. And I was kicking through these things. They were, I believe, interior two-by-four studs. And I'm like, man, normally I could kick three or four and grab five or six. But in this case, I was kicking out 10 to get one. And I'm like, what is the deal? And I'm going through, and I'm going through, and I'm going through. And all of a sudden, I get about, um, for those of you, again, that have picked through a whole bunk of studs, uh, I think, my, my math's a little bit off, but I want to say it's re you're talking close to 300. And I was three rows from the bottom, in the middle of the pile, and I find scratched on one of the studs in big letters, no bueno. <laughs> now, I don't speak much Spanish, but I knew what that meant. Somebody else had looked through these and had determined they weren't good enough to use. What is in your life that is no bueno? What is in your life that you're trying to build your Christian life upon? You've got the foundation set, but you're trying to frame, and you can't figure out why the walls are all wacky. Have you considered the material? Take heed. Is your day-to-day -day life a visual picture of building with spiritual gold, like we have in this passage, or temporal wood? Are you feeding more on God's word or on secular philosophy? There are people that tell me, oh, this is so, the world is doom and gloom, everything's terrible, and oh, no, nothing good is going to happen. I'm like, okay. And then they spend the next 20 minutes telling me how much news they watch every day. There's your problem. 
Fill your, world, your, your, your mind with the secular philosophy if you make that the core focus. And I'm not saying we should hide our heads in the sand. But if you're spending so much time soaking up what the world is trying to feed us, no wonder you're depressed. No wonder your outlook is there's nothing positive happening. I'm telling you what, I think we live at a very exciting time. Yeah, there are some negative things happening. But I'm telling you, when God shakes things up, that's when he wants his believers ready to go. Because there are souls that are hanging in the balance. And when they look at us and see us respond differently, they've got questions. Or when we go out and seek them out, they're more open to listen. When people, when everything's going good, it's really hard to get somebody's attention. Because they're increased with the things of this world. They've got pleasure. They've got all of the stuff at, at their fingertips. And so they think that they don't need God. But that's not a sure foundation. Someday it's going to crumble. So, we need to avoid that secular worldview. Don't buy in. And I know we're in the Sunday night crowd. But don't let your mind buy in and guard against it in your children. This whole evolution versus creation. I was speaking with somebody here just this week. And I said, when you start with, in the beginning, God. That is the baseline of all that you believe. It sure changes your worldview. But when you start with, well, 600 million years. No, 7 billion. No, 24 billion. We can't even comprehend what a million is. Let alone a billion. But all of those eons ago, all the particulate matter in the whole cosmos came together, compressed and spun and exploded and rah, rah, rah. That changes your whole worldview. Suddenly, none of us have value. Suddenly, all of us are a mistake, are an accident. Suddenly, we're just one step up the food chain from the chimpanzee. That's not what God said. God said that he created us in his image. We are a special creation of God. He formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So we got to avoid entertaining the thoughts of that stuff. Boy, another thing that's huge right now is this whole, it used to be LGBTQ. Now it's non-binary. Years ago, I'm not a computer guy. Where's Mike? I know he's probably in here somewhere. But, but binary, non-binary, I thought that was like, you know, computer technological stuff, you know, years and years ago. I would have never guessed that someday we'd be applying that to people. I never, never guessed that the, some of the leaders of our land would be asked questions like, what is a female? And they would answer, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? But yet it shows you when you get away from this book, you are building on material that is no bueno. It's not good. We should avoid carnal lifestyle, feeding the flesh. We should avoid focusing on laying up treasures in this life. It's all going to be gone one day. We should avoid wasting our time and our energy and our focus on things that don't matter while avoiding things that do. All of those things, no bueno. Focus on building your life. Take heed how, they, how you build thereupon. Build with the material that the Lord has given us to build upon. Colossians 3, 8 and 9. But now ye also put off all of these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. That's what the Lord wants us to build upon. You know, you can have the perfect foundation of, on a residential project. And you can get a, a, a group of hacks 
haphazard, sloppy framers can come in who don't care, and no matter how good that foundation is, when that house is done, it's going to be out of square, out of plumb. They will have used materials that were, were, were not good. You'd have bows in the wall, waves in the wall, all kinds of problems. Why? Because they didn't take heed to how they were building. The challenge for us is how are we building thereupon? Third point, furnishings. Please turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I had times with my building where I was putting together a house, and we would do a tremendous job building this house. It came out. It looked great. We had good subcontractors. Everybody worked hard, and I was excited to sign over that final. We've got, we've got our approval from our building inspector, and they can move in. And about a week or two later, I'd swing by the house to check it out, and I'd walk in, and I'd look at the furnishings in the house, and I'd be like, where did they get these furnishings? It took the house and made a nice-looking house look really dumpy, just being honest. And, of course, I always tried to be um, tactful and not talk about it. But the reality was, it took, I knew the work that my men put into this thing, and it made the house that looked so sharp, made it look pretty shoddy. And I, I, was, I was wondering, and I, I understand sometimes people spend all their money in the build and they don't have the money to put nice furnishings in. But in other cases, what if they just didn't really care? They didn't care what kind of a building it was. Uh, yeah, that's beautiful, but uh, we'll just throw this old couch with the springs all poking through, and we'll, we'll, we'll just... We'll just use, those curtains are kind of ratty, but we'll put those up there. That's, that's good enough. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in the great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work." So when I think about this and I look at a house and I say, boy, in the house there are, there are, some, there are some special vessels and there are vessels of earth. There are vessels that have honor and there are vessels that don't. But it talks about, as we said in this last point, about purging yourself from the vessels that are, are going to cause you to falter, to fail. It says, depart from iniquity. But over a page in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Perfect. Now, these next two words. Throughly furnished unto all good works. So think about this for a second. If you pictured your life, your spiritual life, as a house, Looking at your physical house, what would you like to give up? Would you like to do without the bathroom? That would be a bummer. How about, how about the kitchen? Well, we don't really need the kitchen. Have, um, have you ever done a kitchen remodel? When you get into a kitchen remodel, I would always tell my customers, do you understand how stressful this is going to be? I will do my absolute best to make this happen as efficiently as I possibly can for you. But by the time this is done, you're going to want to kill her, she's going to want to kill you, and you're both going to want to kill me. I'm just telling you now. I said, it sounds great. Well, we'll only be without our kitchen for three weeks. We'll only be without our kitchen for two weeks. I said, practice by washing your dishes tomorrow night in the bathtub. I had some people that would have me remodel the kitchen and the bathroom at the same time. But look back at our spiritual lives. That the man of God may be perfect, truly 
furnished. What area of your life have you been closing the, the door to the Lord and saying, God, I'm yours, but not that spot. But not that spot. That's mine. I'm going to do what I want to do there. That's not what this verse is indicating. This verse is indicating that we are to let this word of God dwell in us richly. Let this word of God wash us throughly. Let this word of God work in and through our lives. And if we see something in there that the Lord is challenging us about, we need to get it right. What should we furnish our life with? Well, these are obvious, but sometimes we need to be reminded that daily walk, that personal fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that is a furnishing to have in our lives. That is a bedrock of our life. That personal walk with God, he needs to be Lord of all. Number two, care and concern for our other brothers and sisters. How do we interact with one another? Do we love them? Do we try to bear one another's burdens? Do we re reach out to one another? It was mentioned this morning, I believe. What about cheerfully giving? The Lord loveth a cheerful giver. Say, no, 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 my pocketbook is mine. I work hard for that. Okay, I'll give you that. I almost put my hand in my pocket, Corey. Ask him about that later. Anyway, that's mine. I earned that. Are you kidding me? Try to take your next breath. Tell your lungs to breathe. Try to force your heart to beat. The Lord does that. I told my wife when the Lord called us into this ministry, she said, How are we going to live? How are, how are we going to survive? She said, we've been working. I was working as a nurse. You've been working as a builder. I said, honey, wait a minute. Time out. This is true. But I said, all it would have taken is one fall. Break my back. I'm done. I said, hon, you've worked as an operating room nurse for 20 years. I said, you deal with some very... <laughs> big decision-making things. I said, you make a bad enough, big enough decision on one given day, and they're walking you out, and you're never going to be a nurse again. There's nothing that we have that's our own. It's all him. Cheerful giving. How about our thought life? Stop it, preacher. That's getting a little too personal. Man. The Bible talks about fleeing fornication. The Bible, the, the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. But man, when the Lord Jesus Christ came and he said, I tell you that anybody, if you look on a woman to lust after, you're committing adultery with her in your heart. That is something we got to keep in check. Every day, man. Every day. Our thought life, covetousness, anger, hatred, malice, the thoughts, the intents of our heart. The heart of man is deceitful above all and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, I'm basically a good person. No, we're not. We're sinners saved by grace. It's been said already. If it were not for the mercy of God, we'd all be consumed. Personal evangelism. We need to fill our life with that. We need to be conscious of those around. Because if we have these things, if we have built our life according to God's word, guess what? We're going to be ready to do those things that God wants us to do. You say, well, God's not talking to me. God's not directing me. I'm not... Well, how are you doing with these things? Sometimes we want to be focused on being a missionary when we've got a room or two that have closed doors to the Holy Spirit. We need to open those up. We need to do some cleaning. We need to get rid of, purge ourselves of some of those old, nasty earthen vessels and let the Lord furnish our life throughly with his word. But lastly, let's talk about the final inspection. This is a scary day for some builders. 
I know Brother Brian told me that there was an inspection just this last week, but I remember customers asking me, how are we going to do? How's it going to go? Something about test day. Whether you're a kid in fourth grade, whether you're a builder who's 55, 60 years old, whether it's somebody who's got to take a test for their work. Kelly has had to take multiple tests for her uh, nursing license and different things like that. There's something scary. Because you want to know, am I going to do good enough? Am I going to stack up? Is, is the, how is this test going to come out? And I don't know about the inspectors down here, but up in Wisconsin, they're literally like the Gestapo. They have nobody really over them, although they claim that they do. And they are free to interpret the UDC any way that they want. But it helps a lot when you build correctly. Verses 13 and down, it says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. What day? The inspection day because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work be, shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. There is a, I mentioned it, the UDC, the Uniform Dwelling Code, the code book. And I would always assure my customers, say, we do our absolute best to build according to the codes. I surround myself with subs that do their best to build according to the codes. You say, how do I know when I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ that he's going to be pleased with the building? He gave us a code book. It's right here. He's not trying to be tricky. He's not trying to slip us up because there are some building inspectors that do. There are some building inspectors that I learned they're hobby horses. I could argue and fight with them about their hobby horse that wasn't according to the UDC, but then the next job I did with them, I might as well just forget it. So I'd learn what they wanted, and that's what we would do. Jesus is not like that. Our Savior is not like that. He's not trying to trick us up, trip us up. Remember? We are co-laborers together with God. He said, I've given you everything you need to ace that final inspection. The question is, are we doing it? Are we doing it? Because guess what? None of us gets to opt out. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in eternity. No. That he may receive the things done in his body. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. How many times have you heard a lost person, when you ask them, do you know for sure that you are going to heaven when you die? And they say, I don't know. I'm hoping that my good works outweigh my bad. Do they make an app for that? I mean, are you going to get a, I don't I've got an old school watch. Uh, Kelly's got an Apple watch. Um, are you going to get a buzz, a reminder? Oh, 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 that was a bad work. You better work on some good works. That's, that, doesn't, that doesn't fly. We know that that's not going to get anybody to heaven. But after we have received Christ as our Savior, according to these verses, we're going to get judged on the time that we have. What we do with the time that we have. Why do you think there's so many warnings? Redeeming the time. Walk circumspectly. Someday, we're going to answer. Let me end with this story. 2008. I was talking to the brother in the back. I'm sorry, brother. I don't remember your name. I've heard so many this week. But he was showing me some of the beautiful homes that he's built and he's building. And uh, I told him, I said, most of the houses I built were between two and 3,000 square foot. They were custom homes. They were nice homes. But they were definitely not what I would consider a high-end home. However, in 2008, I had the privilege to build the largest house that I, I've ever built. It was 12,000 square feet. 
And you can imagine a 12,000 square foot house. Just ask our brother in the back. There were all the things you'd expect. Nine bathrooms, two kitchens, a cons music conservatory, a game room for all the big mounts. You know, all the stuff that you'd imagine. Just the deck alone, the out outside deck was 1,700 square feet. On 180 acres overlooking a lake, it was a beautiful, beautiful home. I spent nearly a year and six months of my life building that house for a very wealthy man. The house was gorgeous. Guess what? It was filled with beautiful furnishings. It was an amazing home. I kind of jokingly called it my Sistine Chapel. December 19th, 2019, I was building my last home. The Lord had called me to join couriers. I felt confident that's where he wanted us to be, but I had my one last contract home to finish. And I was working in the afternoon, and my phone started buzzing. And I'm like, oh, man. Because it was, you know, one I can ignore. You get a second one and a third one. Somebody's trying to get a hold of you. So I pull my phone out, and much to my horror, I have a picture of that house on fire. One end is on fire, and the other end is on fire. I'm going, oh, my goodness. And the person who texted me said, look what's happening. Uh, Ten minutes later, I got another picture. Between the two ends, now understand, this house was 232 feet from one end to the other. And the entire roof was on fire in 10 minutes. 15 minutes later, I got another picture, and the walls had started collapsing. It was a colossal failure. In 180 minutes, that house burned flat to the ground. My Aunt Tricia asked me. Um, a couple weeks later, she said, how does that make you feel? And I said, it's a reminder that no matter how beautiful, how rich, how lavish, how much money and effort we throw at the things of this world, someday they will be just like that. Wood, hay, and stubble. It says, what is it, in Peter, that... The elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nothing is escaping that that's on this earth. So, where are we at, Christian? Are we keeping in mind, first and foremost, unbeliever, if you're here, I pray that there isn't, but if anybody's here who's not saved, today is the day of salvation. You are not guaranteed another breath. I hear about people all the time that are dropping over, dropping over, dropping over. You say, well, I'll ask Jesus on my deathbed. What about the person whose heart stops? And that's it. But how are you framing? Are you building with the material found in this book, or are you trying to build with the material of this world and you can't figure out what's going on? What are you furnishing your life with? Where are you putting your energy? Where are you putting your focus? Are you ready? for that final inspection. Because can I say, we don't know when that time is going to come. The trumpet could sound at any moment. I'm not pulling. I, I'm not afraid of death, but I'm not looking forward to it either. Kelly and I have had the conversation a few times. What if you die first? What if I die first? You know, blah, 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 blah. We've been talking about our will and stuff um, for the kid's sake. Uh, we dug our will out of the closet the other day before we went to Poland and realized Zach wasn't even on it yet. We're like, whoa, we haven't looked at this in a while. But if I could choose, I'd just like us all to go in the rapture. Hey, see ya. We're out of here. But there's a work to do until that time comes. And so let's be busy about it. the supplement. I'll read a verse real quick. We had a great mission conference, right? The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. You caught that vision? I think it's been pretty clear. Okay. Number 44.
Now, we do um, want to mention there is one piece that goes to this microphone. It's a clip, it's a black clip. Uh, we can't find it anywhere anywhere on the internet to buy, so we need to find it, right? <laughs> if you ever, if you find that clip, please um, give it to Michael. We are looking for it. We've, we've misplaced it a couple of times. It's around there somewhere, so just look where you are, and if you see it, pick it up, give it to Michael, because we are looking for that. My boss. <laughs> Mike's boss. <laughs> but yeah, if you if you do see that, we are looking for it. Um, next up, we have uh, a very special woman who's going to come give us a word. She she is very faithful, dedicated, very smart. Um, uh, I love love playing the music with her in Puebla. I mean, she gets on and going, and it's a, a good time. Um, really. You're a blessing to us, Karen, and uh, Karen Castillo, bring us the music. been mentioned about different women that um, have gone out of this church that um, were maybe looking for a husband that was going to go to the mission field or had that desire in them um, or that their husband had already been praying about it for a long time. I was neither of those. <laughs> uh, first of all, I really never had like a burning desire to be a missionary, honestly, because my parents were missionaries when I was a little girl uh, in South America, in Colombia, South America. And I was young, five-ish, and I just remember being scared a lot <laughs> because we had somebody break in our house through my bedroom window and somebody cut the watch off my mom's arm at a stoplight. You know, just little things that kids kind of freak out about. So I never, like, I was, you know, my sister Debbie Kincaid was, uh, had definitely had more of that um, vision that, and then I married my husband in 1992, and in 1993 there was a mission conference. And before that, he was um, speaking to me about how difficult he couldn't even imagine standing up in an open meeting. He couldn't even imagine he could never do that. He, he admired so many people that did it, but it, that wasn't going to be his position. And um, I was just thankful that he had gotten saved, that I had gotten right, and that we were we were starting our journey together in the Lord. And then that year in 93, a year after we were married, um, the mission conference started on Sunday. And around Wednesday, we both had jobs working and all that. And then he just mentioned to me in bed one night, I think God wants me to go to Mexico. Um, of course, by then he had been staring in the mission field, but um, doing visiting and things like that. And I kind of freaked out again that five-year-old freaked out girl kind of <laughs> popped up in my mind. Um, but I just, something in me, the Lord, I think, just gave to me a, um, a spirit of don't get in the way. <laughs> you know, just don't get in the way. Right. You know, it might not be me. It might not be the, the vision that he has. It might not be my own at this moment. But I didn't want to get in the way. And I'm thankful for that, that God gave me that. And um, I praise the Lord because Mexico is home to me. It truly is. I never thought it would be, but God has been good. And um, I thank the Lord for a husband that has been faithful, that has been solid, um, solid for many people in Mexico. But he's been my solid ground apart from the Lord. <laughs> um, in Psalm chapter 89, just something that the Lord has been dealing with me about in this psalm. I wanted to share it with you. It might seem a little strange to try to, uh, a missionary trying to um, talk about getting a vision, but a lot of times I do lose my vision of the condition of a lost soul and um, what it truly is. So many times we are, we're dealing with ministering to those who've already been saved, and that becomes uh, so much of the labor um, and, it, and that in itself obviously is tiring and there's ups and downs. 
but the vision of what is uh, a lost soul is uh, their, their condition, truly. In Psalm 89, starting in verse 15, um, get my glasses on. <laughs> it says, Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. For thou art the glory of their strength, and in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. For the Lord is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Just thinking about that joyful sound, I believe that for us in this day, the joyful sound is the, the sound Jesus saves, the message of salvation. And thinking of this, this, this phrase, blessed is the people that know the joyful sound, it automatically creates a separation. There's obviously another group that doesn't know the joyful sound. It creates two groups of people. And I'm thankful, uh, I mentioned in an open meeting this week, how grateful I am for God's mercy that, that I was raised in a Christian home. And I didn't just hear a small note of that sound my whole life, um, or just hear about, there's some sound out there that people are talking about. I knew, and I know today the sound personally and anyone that's saved, that is a born-again believer, we know that joyful sound. Amen. And I just want to look at a few of the benefits from being that blessed people who know the joyful sound. The first benefit from knowing that joyful sound is in verse 15. It says, they shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. Now, I'm, I'm a person who likes contrast and comparison. It's a great blessing to me to, to consider that. And thinking about this benefit from knowing the joyful sound of salvation is that I can walk in the light of God's countenance, in his presence. Yet those who don't know the, the joyful sound, first of all, they're not a blessed people at the moment. Their state, their condition is they're under condemnation. And they're not benefiting because they're actually at great risk and they're hindered by not knowing and as far as being and walking in the light of God's countenance, they're actually the opposite. They're stumbling in the darkness of the absence of God in their life. Verse 16 says, In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, those that know the joyful sound, that have that personal relationship with Christ. I possess the source of true rejoicing, endless rejoicing. It says all the day. All my lifetime, I have no reason to not rejoice because I've known salvation personally. It says, thy name, the name of Jesus, just hearing his name and thinking on his name, those who know him, it stirs your heart. So many things come to mind, so many emotions, so, many, so, many, so much thanksgiving and rejoicing just automatically comes when you hear his name. Like Song of Solomon says, thy name is as ointment poured forth. We know his name is the ointment for a weary, wounded soul. But yet the person who does not know, that people that does not know the joyful sound, they are trying substitutes for the true source of rejoicing. Um, they're indifferent or maybe even angry at the mention of the name of Jesus, which the Bible explains us in Corinthians that obviously it's a normal reaction. The natural man um, just can't perceive um, somebody magnifying the name of Jesus. They consider that foolishness. Verse 16, the second part says, In thy righteousness shall they be exalted. Wow, that to me is salvation too. It's just salvation. My, his righteousness is what exalts me. His righteousness is what made me a daughter of God. Now are we the sons of God. And it's because of Jesus Christ, the righteous one. But that people who knoweth not, who do, who do not know the joyful sound, they're unknowingly under condemnation for they're seeking their own righteousness, usually, which, as the brother said today, God views as filthy rags. In verse 17, the second part, it says, and in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. While his righteousness exalts me. <laughs> um, sorry, I already said that one. <laughs> verse 17, um, it says, for thou art the glory of their strength. I'm strong only when I'm relying and glorying in Christ Jesus and his strength. Amen. It says that he's the glory of my strength. It's a beautiful thing to behold somebody strong in the Lord. 
but those who don't know the joyful sound are bound to and can only rely on, like the Bible says, the weak and beggarly elements of this world. The second part, I'm sorry, in verse 17, it says, In thy favor our horn shall be exalted. Those who know the joyful sound are powerful, even victorious in a battle, in a spiritual battle. We can have victory, but only because of Christ's favor, his character, his exalting of our weakness. <laughs> but there's also a battle going on within those that don't know the joyful sound. They're in a battle, they're striving, um, exalting themselves against the knowledge of God. The Bible describes them as those that oppose themselves. There's a strife going on within those that don't know the joyful sound. And lastly, in verse 18, the Lord is our defense and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Praise the Lord, brethren, that those who know the joyful sound, we have a defender. Amen. We have somebody who is right there with us, walking with us and defending us against the wiles of the devil. And he's our God, he's our Lord, he's our King. And yet those that don't know the joyful sound, they're, they're actually taken captive by somebody else, by the devil. It says that they have him. He has them at his will, taken captive at his will, in his snares, whether it be false religion, sin, men's philosophies. And I just, um, I just wanted to consider um, the condition of these people, the other people. And truly, there really is only one distinction between humans, it's those that are saved and those who are lost. And those glorious life-changing benefits for those who know the joyful sound of salvation are eternal. They're everlasting. They're something so precious that I so many times take for granted. Psalm 116 verse 12 says, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? So there is that second group of people, those who do not know the joyful sound. There's no light. There's no source of joy in Jesus' name. There's no sustaining or uplifting righteousness in themselves. And there's no divine strength or defense. If you'll turn to 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12. It says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which, God, which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And then verse 13 says at the beginning, which things also we speak. What shall I render? What shall I render for having that benefit of knowing the joyful sound? Well, I have to speak those things that were freely given to me, that somebody else spoke to me. Somebody else took the time to speak them to me. And I just want to encourage you to, to speak those things, to be to be aware of that second group of people. Yes, praise the Lord for this joyful sound that I have heard and that has guided me, that has been um, just an, an enormous blessing. Like it said, blessed are the people. The, the hymn, Jesus Saves, I just wanted to read a few of the lines that are, are so um, challenging. It starts out with, we have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, amen. But then the entire rest of the hymn is about, okay, what do you do with that now? Just a few lines. Spread the tidings all around. Bear the news to every land. Amen. Tell sinners far and wide. Sing above the battle strife. There is strife. Sing it softly through the groom when the heart for mercy craves. Let the nations now rejoice. Shout salvation full and free. This our song of victory. May more nations and more sinners rejoice and also join in the song of victory. Jesus saves. Praise you, Lord. Amen. Amen. John and Karen are a real blessing. <laughs> They're a fun, faithful couple serving the Lord. And they've been serving the Lord in Mexico for... A uh, long time, <laughs> long time, uh, ever since I can remember. <laughs> I remember uh, the first time I, I, I stood up to preach, it was in one of those uh, blue lona <laughs> marketplaces, the dirt floor, and I was small, and I, John was right there, and my dad was there, and, and John was there, and I started preaching, and, and that was a blessing. John is always there. He's very faithful, you know. Uh, Few, five years later, I was about 16, 17, and 
Now we were in Puebla and I was preaching another street. <laughs> I start preaching and this, this drunk man just comes up and stands right in front of me and starts screaming as loud as he can. And I'm trying to preach, so I keep preaching, and I turn around and look at John. John's there. John's there. And he's still over there just looking and laughing and doesn't do anything. He's always been there. He's always been there. He's a faithful brother. I really enjoy, enjoy John. I love John and Karen. And, and boy, they're a blessing. And so, John, uh, this is your time. Please bring what the Lord has put on your heart. Oh, there's a special person. <laughs> we didn't know you could sing. <laughs> you still don't. <laughs> just, want to, just want to read one quick verse. Psalm 81, verse 1 says, Sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Amen. Amen. Well, who would have guessed that uh, 
that a ribeye would get so many people excited. <laughs> Tell you what, Brother Brian, I think I'm going to upgrade yours to a tomahawk. All right? I'll, f I'll find a tomahawk somewhere. No, that's, that's good. Brian, Brian spoke to me, and he said, I don't know if anyone's going to come, brother, but uh, he said, I'm going to be there. So that's good. That's good. I mean, I hope more people show up, but all right, great. Great, 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 great. It's your freezer. <laughs> Ribeye would be just the last night, all right? Not every night. <laughs> it's going to be a week of fasting. Uh, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a good week, uh, a lot of fun. It's been a different kind of week, I think. Uh, I'm refreshed. I'm going back. Uh, very, uh, very refreshed. Thank you, thank you for for this time. A lot of a lot of new people that that we met this time. Uh, it was good. I met a lot of new people in New York that I didn't know a few weeks ago when we were there, and a lot of new people here. Uh, you know what that tells me? The Lord's doing something. <laughs> Lord is changing. Lord is uh, um, uh, touching hearts. That 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 gets that gets me excited um, when I um, when I think about it. But um, Thanks a lot, the the uh, the uh, nursery uh, workers too. Boy, they they uh, no kids in here during during these times, and and uh, man, I th I think it's a real blessing for for people to take time and take care of your kids. Um, you know, especially my grandbabies. They're pretty wild, those kids. <laughs> yeah, spoiled rotten man. <laughs> Chapter nine. <laughs> Chapter nine. All right, let's uh, try to get you guys out of here real quick. Um, I'm always short. All right. John chapter nine. Let's let, let's read a few verses in here. Uh, and as Jesus passed by, and he saw a man which was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me, while it is day, the night cometh where no man can work. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, for, thank you for this week, Lord. Thank you for a good time, Lord, that you've uh, given us, that you've refreshed our spirits, Lord, and and uh, we hope that, uh, that uh, our, our time, my, my brethren uh, this week, Lord, who uh, brought uh, uh, what was on their heart, and, and the ladies as well, Lord, we just uh, thank you for the word that was uh, given. Thank you for the testimonies, Lord. And Father, we just ask that uh, in these times, especially in these times, there's so, so, many, so many problems and fears and, and uh, uh, just things that are going on, Lord, and, and we still see... Uh, you in the midst, Lord. Uh, help us keep our eyes focused on you and help us not to uh, 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 move our eyes from you, Lord. We want to want to do your will. We want to want to be able to finish this this uh, task, Lord, that, that, that you've given uh, your people to do, Lord, and especially uh, this church here in San Antonio, Lord. I just ask that you just uh, continue to, to bless our efforts, Lord. I pray also for the couriers, Lord, that you continue to bless them as they go Amen. out and they help out uh, other churches, Lord, and publish the word and, and get, get the Bible in people's hands, Lord. I just thank you for these opportunities, these open doors that you've given us, Lord. I just thank you and love you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me, Lord. Just thank you for reaching out for me, Lord. Just thank you how you changed my life. In Jesus' name. You know, t um, tonight, just, just very quickly, I want to talk about uh, uh, the value of this hour. And, and by this hour, I'm talking about the limited or, sh or short period of time that we have. Uh, time goes by so fast, so many things, uh, you know, are happening. I mean, it's already July, you know? It's, I mean, it's just crazy. Half the year's already gone. You know, by the time we know it, we're going to be eating ribeyes in Puebla. I mean, it's, it times it just, just goes by really, really fast. 
And uh, we got to get busy during this time. I mean, I really, I really, I mean, I know people, you know, say it all the time. They've been saying it for, for, forever. You know, the Lord's coming back. The Lord's coming back. I don't know when he's going to come back. You, you either. But one thing I do know, we're going to see him. We are going to see him. You, you either he's going to come back and we're going to, we're going to fly out of here. And man, I'm looking forward to that. If, if I could, if, 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 if I had a choice as well, like the brother was saying, that'd be a good day. We just all fly out all together. That, that'd be really, really, that'd be a good day. But you know what? It, it doesn't matter. One day, whatever happens, if he comes for us or, or we go be with him, uh, we're going to see him. We're going to see him face to face. I mean, this is, this is the, the story that we have, it, there's, there's, there's nothing like it. The, the, the service that we have, the, the, the person that we serve, there's nothing like it. I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter what you do in this life. The best thing that you could do is serve Christ, you know? And I think the best decision, you know, that, that, I, that I made was, you know, a long time ago, <laughs> 31 years ago, 30, 31 years ago, got saved. 31 years ago, right, right around here somewhere, you know, did some good business. Back then, we had these curtains. I, don't, I had no idea why those curtains were there, but they're <laughs> ugly curtains, but they, they're huge <laughs> curtains, but, but there I was, and I did business with God that week, and uh, Man, God saved me, and that, that was good. Today, today I, had, I had an opportunity to see uh, Jorge uh, Ochoa, and he serves in another church now, but me and him got saved that same week. He was on one side of the room, and I was on the other side of the room, and, and, and that week, you know, God was dealing with him and his Taco Bell. I don't know who, who, who talked to him or, or how he got here. I, I, I forget that part of the story, but we ended up, me and him, that week here every night. I had no idea who he was until after we both got saved that week, and uh, we became good friends. We're good friends to this day. Man, the Lord has really given me uh, an incredible time, but that 31 years, it's gone by really fast. You know, um, it, it's, it, the, when it says right here, the night, the night cometh when no man can work, that, that phrase to me implies urgency right? It's when our time or moment or privilege is taken away. I'm going to try to stay with my, with my outline so I can just be quick. Uh, you, you know, time is a gift, right? It's precious. <laughs> it's, something, it's, it's something that God has, 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 has allowed us to have. It's, it's more valuable than any precious stone you could possibly have. Time is, you know, I wish, I wish I still had my dad here, you know? I mean, lots of times I think about that. I think about my father. You know, I'm hoping, you know, that I'll see him one day. I'm hoping. You know, and, and uh, the reason why I have that hope is because I've said it lots of times, but when my, it was during a mission conference also when, when my father passed away. And he called. He called me here at this church. A long time ago when we used to use telephones that were connected to walls. Yeah, back in, uh, back in 97, man, 97, a long time ago, uh, he called me at this church one night, and, and that was funny, too, because they never used the, the phones in this church. It, they just had, you know, hooked up to answering machines, that's it. You know, no one really, you know, used it. We didn't have, like, a, you know, there was an office back there, but there was no office, really, to speak of, but long story short, after, after he died, and he called me, and he wanted to talk to me, and I gave him the gospel one more time, and I said, do it now, Dad. I'll see you tomorrow. We'll talk about this. And he said, I want to talk to you about it. Well, we hung up, and then the next day, my sister called and said he passed away. So when I went home, funeral services, all that, all, all that got done. I got to preach his, his, his funeral. Which, which that was a real blessing. All his friends were there. A lot of people from the church, from, a, from the town were there. And I got to preach the gospel. But when I went home, and I sat down and started looking at, at, at his stuff, I saw a Bible there. And you know that track that we pass out that now it's white? The little, the little um, uh, track from the church here. It used to be yellow back, back in the day. And... Uh, 
uh, it gave a, a clear, a clear um, uh, information about the gospel, about salvation. And it was in that Bible, a Bible that I gave him. And I pulled it out, and I turned it around, and it had the phone number to this church. I'm thinking, that's how he called. <laughs> he called this church with that phone number. Because I, there's no, I, I didn't use this phone. I, I, I don't give out phones, you know, to this church. No, no one's going to answer it. <laughs> but I'm sitting there thinking, and I was just having a ball fest that, that, that uh, afternoon or whatever time it was because I was thinking, my father was reading this tract. He didn't call the priest. He didn't, he didn't call somebody else. He called his son. He wanted to know about God through me. Time. Time is so precious. Time is the gift that God gives you, and you have, you have, sometimes we take that for granted. You know? I'm thinking today, today when I was when I was listening to uh, to Eddie, man, he's, you know, how old are you, Eddie? Like 70 or 80 or something like that? I don't know, I don't know how, how old he is, but 65. Doesn't look a day over 70. But 65, 65 years old, I mean, at, you know, that's difficult. At, 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 you know, at, at my age, when I went out, you know, 20, 28, 29 years ago, I, I was young and dumb and, you know, no problems, you know. I, I could go. I could do it. But I'm thinking, at 65, that's a big decision to step out and leave, you know, especially with, with, with everything that you talked about today. That's a huge, that's, that's the, you know, the longer you wait to do something for Christ, and I'm not just saying go into another field. I'm just anything, anything. You, I mean, the, the, longer, the longer you wait to just step out your door and start knocking on your neighbor's houses and saying, hey, you know what, can we have a Bible study? Or I want, I'm having a Bible study at my house, you know, can, you know well, I want to invite you. Whatever it is, but, but to, to, to get the salvation message out, if the longer you wait, the busier you're going to get. Your life is going to get more cluttered. And you're just not going to have the energy. You know, was it was it Corey today talking about those those two uh, uh, preachers that were there with them, and one had to stay right near the host, uh, the hotel because when he got tired, he had to go in and rest. You know, I'm not there yet, right? But look, it's going to come a time where you you're not going to be able to do as much as you can right now. I mean, Brother Lindell doesn't go door to door no more, do you? Oh, forget about it. You know, that time, and you used to do a lot of it. You used to a whole getting home from from school. I mean, I've heard all the stories. I was I was under his preaching. I, I heard exactly. I I can probably. But you come to a time when you when you get old and this body gets run down and you don't have that energy. Time just slips by. You know, it says it says the uh, in Ecclesiastes in chapter three that that it's it's a gift from God. Time. It's a time for everything. It's a gift from God. You know, all creation, oblivious to time, right? You, you go look at a cow. The cows ain't worried about time. You know, you look at a dog, you especially look at a cat. The cat is the dumbest thing. I mean, you know, they have no idea what's going on, <laughs> right? I mean, my, 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 my three-year-old granddaughter is hilarious. Kids have no concept of time either, Right? Cosette, Cosette, she's, when she goes to bed at night and it's time for her to go to bed, she always asks, uh, in 30 minutes, 30 minutes. She has no idea what 30 minutes is, <laughs> but somewhere she heard 30 minutes and she, and she figured out in her head that that is going to buy her a little bit of time, so she goes, in 30 minutes, and th- everything to her is 30 minutes. No concept of time. But you know, your time and my time and, and, and there's come a, a, a time in your life when you're, when, when you, when you're not a child anymore, and, some, and, 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 and there's a time where you, where you understand that you have a limited amount of time, right? Maybe not so much if, you're, if you don't know Christ and you're in the world. Maybe, maybe you, you try to ignore uh, that, that, that you're not going to live forever. Uh, but as a, as a believer, you and I, man, it, it's... It came clear, 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 clear. Even when God was working with me and, and, and working in my heart, uh, I knew I had a limited time. 
That, that was one thing that I understood from, from that conversation I had, from that preacher, when th- that conversation, I said, I can die any second and I will go to hell. And I was so, I was so, I was so scared because I didn't want to die. I didn't want to go to hell. And I needed a little bit more time. A little bit more time. Just a little bit more. And I made a deal with God. I remember it's so crazy. I remember I made a deal with God that week. And I said, just let me stay alive for one week more. And this guy invited me to a week, a week uh, of meetings. I'll go. That, that'd be, that's my promise to you, God. I will go every night. I will listen. At the end of the week, I'll make a decision. But I need time. And it, man, and God, I think God, in, in, a, in, a, in as much as an audible voice that God can give us, I think he said, okay. Thank you, Lord. Because I could start that car that, that evening, and I could go home. That's how scared I was. I didn't want to start the car. I was thinking, I could, I could die on the side of the road. God's faithful. Thank you, Lord. You know, uh, time is, is, something, is something very precious. And we have only a certain amount of time for the opportunities that God gives us, you know? Have you had opportunities? I mean, and I'm not talking about spiritual opportunities. There's been opportunities that come into my life that, that, that I jumped on it, and i not even thinking. Right? I remember we, we, were, we were in Itapuato, uh, you know, for just a little bit, and Karen, and, and Karen needed a procedure done, and we had this doctor, and... Karen needed a procedure, and so we go into, into his office there, and he had like a little clinic there, uh, and uh, he said, look, it's going to be an outpatient procedure, right? And we said, okay, good. So they put her under, and they were doing it. Well, he comes back out. Just like in, you know, a few minutes later, he comes back out, and he says, well, it's, it's a little bit more serious than, than what we thought. We could stop right now, but then I'd, I'd charge you for the time that's already here, and then, you know, we can reschedule, you know? So I was like, okay, and, what, and what's the other option? He goes, well, we can continue. And, you know, obviously it's going to be a little bit more money, but we can continue, and, you know, she can still go home today, but it's going to be a little bit more, more of a procedure. And I said, okay, well, let's go with that, you know? I want to definitely, you know, I want my wife to be, be well. He goes, okay, well, if you want, you can, you can come in with me. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, if you want, you can scrub in and c- I'm like, yeah, I didn't even think about it, you know? Uh, what an opportunity. I could be a doctor for an hour. I'm like, I love Mexico. I say, yes. So I'm in there, and I'm thinking the reason why he wanted me in there is because obviously he didn't think it was going to be a little bit that much more of a procedure, but I guess he, he needed somebody to hold some tools because that's what I did. It was an amazing thing. I'm in there. I'm holding these tools. I'm thinking, wow, this is so cool. We get, we get done, he, he, uh, he, he sews her up, I'm in there in the, in, the, in, the, in the room, I'm in the room, you know, Karen's barely waking up, and I'm thinking, Karen, I operated on you. <laughs> what an opportunity. I was like, man, I, man I'm a doctor for just one hour, crash course. I've had one patient, and she survived. Huh? <laughs> Opportunities. Opportunities. You, you only have a certain amount of time. You have to take it. What, what is, what's placed in front of you? What, what, what has God given you? Don't, don't, uh, don't, uh, uh, menos preciar. Why always forget the English word? Don't, don't, don't. What is it? Undervalue. undervalue. Uh, don't undervalue what God has given you. Amen. You know, whatever it is, what, whatever God has put in front of you, whatever God wants you to do, do it and do it to the Lord. Do, do it heartily. Do it, do it with all your might. And let me tell you, we are all called to give the gospel. Amen. It's not that difficult to hand out a track. You know, and people are, people are searching. There in Puebla, during COVID, all churches were closed, except for the rebels in 89 Poniente. We stayed open, 
you know? I think we closed like for, I don't know, how long did we close? Like two weeks maybe or something? Something like that. I, I forget how long we closed because that was very at the beginning. We had no idea what was going on. I mean, you know, but after like a couple of weeks sitting at home and not leaving, we're thinking, what are we doing? <laughs> you know, we're sitting here, you know, just looking around and, and so, so fearful going outside and, oh, we can't shake hands. We can't, we can't, you know, and I, look, I'm sorry. I don't want to get offend anybody. I, I understand. From the time I went down to Mexico, Bill, always, every time we came over preaching, wash your hands, wash your hands. I wash my hands. So fearful. But you know what? People came to our church. They'd pop in and say, are you, you guys still open? Say, yeah, we're still open. You know, we have this, it's a very small church. We, we tried our best to do social distancing, but it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, it's, Eddie's seen, it's a garage. It's a long garage, you know, one car garage going all the way to the back. I mean, we're like, okay, you know, we're social distancing. <laughs> I mean, whatever, <laughs> you know, it's just, we would tell you know, our people, if you're sick, stay home. No problem. If you're not sick, come. <laughs> Urgency. We have opportunities. You know, there's a story over there in uh, 1 Kings 20 uh, about, about a prophet. There's a king named Ahab, and he was supposed to, he was supposed to wipe out a certain people. He let somebody live, and, uh, and God had, had a problem with it. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's an incredible story because this prophet that goes and is, gonna, is going to confront the king, he, uh, he, he um, disguises himself. But before he disguises himself, right, he tells one of his, one of his friends, one of his buddies, you don't need soap operas on TV. Let me tell you, read the Bible. It's, it's pretty good. <laughs> but he goes to one of his friends, somebody who, who, who knows God too, and he says, look, smack me. And the guy says, no, I'm not going to smack you. And he says, well, because you didn't, you didn't want to smack me, you want to do the word, you know, what, what, what the Lord called, called you to do or, 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 or told me to tell you to do, you're going to die. A lion's going to eat you. So I don't, I, don't know, I don't think he believed it, but when he, well, he walked out, the lion found him. Well, then he goes to another guy, and of course, he probably heard the story. He said, I want to smack you. <laughs> you know? I mean, you would figure the first guy would have said, the first guy would have said, you know what, really? Seriously? A lion? Oh, okay, I'll smack you. I'll change my mind. But you know, he didn't change his mind. He stayed firm. No, I'm not going to smack you. You know what? You can change your mind. God's dealing with you with something. You, you, you know God is speaking to you. You know this is, the, I mean, this guy was obviously a prophet, obviously somebody who God sent, and he had a message for him, and he, he didn't want to help him out, and he got killed for that. I mean, what would have happened? I think, I think maybe God would have said, good, I'm glad you changed your mind, and he would have smacked him, just like Jonah changed his mind. But he didn't. So he goes... After he gets smacked, and he disguises himself, and he goes and he, and he uh, talks, to the, uh, talks to the king. And he says, he says look, he says, uh, I, uh, I, I was in the battle, right? And somebody gave me this guy to, to uh, apprehend, to keep, right? And I had that responsibility, and if, I, if something happened to this guy, they were going to require my life. Look what it says. Look what it says there. And uh, if you want to go, First Kings. First Kings, twenty. It's 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 a it's a great story. You just need to read it. It says uh, in verse thirty nine. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle, and behold, the man turned aside and brought a man unto me, and said, Keep this man, if by any means he be missing, then shall thy life for, be for his life, or else thou shalt uh, pay a talent of silver. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be. 
thyself hast decided. You know, you're responsible for your own decisions. And, and I don't want to get into the story just for the simple fact of this guy was in, in this little parable that he gave. He was busy doing stuff, right? He was busy doing things. And in the midst of doing things, he let the most important task that he had, and he let it go. He had, that, that was the most, I, no, the king wouldn't have had a problem. No one would have had a problem. He said, you know what? This is all I'm going to do. Have you, have you gone to the, uh, uh, to the tomb of the, I think it's an unknown soldier? I think I said what, what, what they call it in Washington, where, that, where those guards are there for 24 hours or whatever it is, and then they do the changing of the guards. That's their only job. Their only job is to be there and make sure that no one messes with that tomb. Right? And you, you can say, wow, how much do these guys get paid? I mean, that's a waste of money. You know, he's a soldier. He should, he should be doing something else. You know, that is his job. That's something that was given to him. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. You know, the, 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 the military, for whatever reason, they say, we want to honor these men who gave their lives for us. And this is what we've decided, and they will, there will always be someone there. I've seen videos where it's like hurricane, you know, winds, and they're out there, you know, still marching. You know, I'm thinking, man, this is crazy. Go fight. No, to them it's not crazy. This is my job. This is my time, and it doesn't matter. I will protect this place. Incredible. The night cometh when no man can work. You know, time is, is uh, unyielding. You can't stop a clock. I'm sorry. You can stop a clock, but you can't stop time. You know, in my house, I have have an old clock, an old wind-up clock, a little black clock that that, uh, we got from from Karen's grandfather uh, on her mom's side. And it's a real cute little clock, but you obviously have to wind it. It's it's really useless because I'm not going to be there winding it all the time. (laughs) But but, uh, it's real nice. And, you know, I have that clock set to 125. It's frozen at 125, because <laughs> that's when my daughter was born, 125. You know, you can't freeze time, but in 1996 when she was born, wow, that was a good day. You know, I, you know when, when, I, when I saw my daughter for the first time, so small, so tiny, she had so much hair. And her eyes were so big. <laughs> and she was looking at me. She was just looking at me. Had that same experience with, my, with, with Cosette, my first granddaughter. Same thing. A lot of hair and big old eyes. And I got her, and man, that same feeling. If I went back to 1996. Wow, my Lauren. You, you, can, you can stop a clock, but you can't stop time. You can, you can try to convince yourself that you can stop time? You seen these people that do plastic surgery? And bless your heart if you've done plastic <laughs> surgery. Bless your heart. You know, these people that, that, uh, that well, okay. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go any further, babe. Anyways, you're not fooling anybody. <laughs> you're old, you got problems, you try to fix it with other things to try to hold back time. Just go, just gracefully. Get old. It's not a problem. We, this, it's not like a surprise. We don't like wake up and say, oh my goodness, I'm old. No, it happens to everybody. It's impossible to control the minutes, the days, the years. Impossible. The Bible says, a night cometh when no man can work. Time slips away. It's volatile, Right? You can't, you can't uh, treasure it up. You can't keep it in your possession for a later time. You know, in Acts 24, there was a governor by the name of Felix. You know, if you read that chapter, if you read when Paul is there speaking with them, it almost seems like to me like he got convicted. Like there was a conviction there that he was listening and he was like, man, that, I need to do something with that information. And you know what he says? Go thy way. For this time, when I have convenient season, I will call for thee. 
bad mistake. You know, that, that, that day 31 years ago when I got saved, that thought did not co- did cross my mind. You know, the thought that, that, that crossed my mind was I made a deal with God and I'm going to make a decision today. <clears throat> Today's that decision. I'm going to either stay right here because the preacher said, if you want to do business with God, if you, if you want to get saved, if you want to ask the Lord to save you, come to the front. Right? I thought, okay, that's how you get saved, right? You just go to the front. Right? The whole, whole lot to that story that, that uh, I didn't just come to the front and raise my hand. They actually pulled out the Bible and, and the preacher who, Uncle Del, uh, Del West, who gave me uh, that talk the week before, ran through the gospel with me one more time. Make sure I understood it. And I said, that's what I want. And then he says, I can't, I can't pray for you. I'll pray with you, but you got to ask the Lord. And that's what I did. I had no idea what I was doing in, in the sense of, I was like, well, you know, I'm Catholic. Don't you have, like, something printed out? You know, I'm thinking this in my head. <laughs> Much easier. Print it out for me. I can read it. No, 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 no. You know, you got to speak to God. And God listens. Isn't that amazing that God listens? Amen. You know, he, he, you know, like it says there in Isaiah, man, you know, come, I want to reason with you. You want to reason with me? I, who, who, who am I? And God says, I want to reason with you. Let's just talk it out. King Agrippa, we, we know the story, Acts 26. What does he say? You almost, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. Man, People, I've, I've, if, if, if there's someone here who is not saved, let, let's just say, let's just say you, 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 you're in agreement. Let's say you've had conversations with people. Let's say, let's say you're right there, but you don't know. You know what I would do tonight? I'd get that right. You know, I've heard of people say, well, you know, I remember making a profession of faith. I remember saying a prayer, but I don't know if that really, if, 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 I really did it, and they told me, so I had to do it again. Praise God, do it again. Make sure, make sure that that is is covered. There's no, there's no shame in that. You know, if somebody makes fun of you, oh, you got to do it again. They're not your friend, because you know what I would tell you. You're not sure. You don't, you, you don't know exactly what you did back then. That's fine. Get it right right now. Is God dealing with you right now? Is God speaking to you right now? Don't let it slip. You know, there's another guy uh, in Mark 6.20, if you want to go there. Herod. He puts, he puts John in jail, right? You know the story. But it says there in Mark 6.20, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Now, pick up on that phrase, he did many things. You know, Herod never repented. Herod, Herod cut off John's head. Shortly after that, they had that big old pachanga, and, you know, he, he told his, his, uh, his, uh, his, his stepdaughter or whatever, you know, what do you want? I'll give you, I'll give you, you know, half my kingdom, whatever he said, you know, and she asked her mom and says, the head of John the Baptist. And he had to do it. Well, he didn't have to do it, but he did it. Look what it says there. He did many things. You know what sometimes people do when they, and, and not only lost people, not only lost people when they're, when they're given the gospel, but Christians, they're, 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 so, they're so busy in many things to try to shake off what God is trying to tell them. Don't be like Herod. You don't let this thing slip. Don't, don't let this thing go. But you know, in the Bible, some seize the moment. You have, you have people like, uh, like uh, 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 Bartimaeus in, in, in Mark 10. That, that story is incredible because he's there, and his name is Blind Mark. <laughs> Bartimaeus, did you imagine living all your life? Oh, yeah, it's blind Bartimaeus. No, he didn't stay blind all his life. God, Jesus Christ gave him sight, but he was known as blind Bartimaeus. 
But when he heard that Jesus was coming through there, he started screaming. And you know what they told him? Quiet. Quiet. But you know what he said? No, 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 no. I'm not going to let this slip. There was a multitude coming with Jesus Christ. He had to yell. He had to be, he, he had to stir some things up to get what he wanted. Another guy, how about the leper in Mark 8? If you, Jesus, Jesus is coming down from the mountain with a multitude of people. He just preached. He just gave, gave the, the Sermon on the Mount. A, a real famous passage in the Bible, right? Even the people who don't believe the Bible, they, they read the Sermon on the Mount, and they think it's just such, such beautiful literature. Well, that was a great sermon. That was Jesus Christ giving awesome information. But he just comes down from that, and he has a bunch of people, and the leper. And if you, know, if you know about lepers in the Bible, they could not get w w w within a certain distance of, of people. It was against the law. And it didn't matter. He ran up to him. Let's just go look at that real quick, please. Look what it says there in, in uh, Mark. In, yeah, I'm sorry, Matthew. Matthew. Eight. It says, and behold, there came a leper, in, in verse 2, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. A leper coming up to Jesus and getting a hold of Jesus and he got what he wanted. Blind, Mar blind Bartimus, Bar Bar Bartimus. You know what it says there if you read that story? It says Jesus stood still. He stood still. Do, do you, is, God dealing with, is God dealing with you with something? Salvation, work, getting busy? I don't know what it is. But you know what? You can actually make God stand still. If you cry out to him and just say, I want to surrender. I want to do what you want. And God says, God, God the creator of all this, he, he, he comes to you and he, he, you, get, you get his attention, his undivided attention. Do you know what that is? I see, I see it in my, in my grandkids' faces when they get Matt's undivided attention. Right? They light up. Jesus stood still. How about, how about Zacchaeus? Right? He climbed up a tree. Climbed up a tree just to look. He saw Jesus. Jesus saw him and says, I'm going to go to your house today. He ran down. He seized the moment. He said, Christ is going to come into my house? Christ wants to dine with me? He wants to talk to me? Don't pass, don't pass that up. And time, one more thing, time is irreversible. Right? You can't get it back. Speaking about Felix, if you go there in... Uh, in um, in Acts 24, 25 and 26, it says in 26, wherefore he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. It's, it seemed to me, it seemed to me like, you know, there was nothing on Netflix that night and he just wants to talk a little bit with Paul. But that one day that he spoke to him was the day he should have responded. The day he got, actually got convicted. And then when he sent him away, he would just call for him when he got bored, oh, I'll talk to you again. Got bored of them, sent him away. He missed that opportunity. Look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that if you go home today and you know God's dealing with you with something, that God's not going to speak to you again and not going to call for you again and not going to reach out to you, for you again. But why take that <laughs> chance? 
especially if you're not saved. Why take that chance? You know what? I was I, one thing that appealed to me that that caught my attention during that week during that conference was about salvation. Not only was it free, but I didn't have to do anything for it. It wasn't like, oh, you need a, a week of classes, or you need you need some type of degree, or you need to read your Bible from cover to cover. You need a, not nothing. It says you come as you are. You know, I think I'm just going to end it there. The night cometh when no man can work. You know, if, if, you, if, if, if you're to work the work of your father, it can start today. It needs to start today. The, the choice is yours. Just like that little parable that that prophet said, so shall thou judgment be, thyself hast decided it. You can't blame the pastors. You can't blame the people around you. You can't blame your boss. You can't blame anybody if you let it pass. Thou thyself hast decided it. You know, I read, I read one time they asked, uh, they asked D.L. Moody one time, because it's, it's daunting. It's daunting to think that uh, how are we going to reach the world? It's, it's, it's daunting. It's, it's this, this whole idea of, of going in and going into all the world, you, you can't do it, I can't do it. It's imp- this church can't do it. It's impossible. And they asked D.L. Moody one time, how are we going to do that? How are we going to reach the world? How are we going to save all these people? You know what his response was? One at a time. It's that simple. One at a time. The problem is you got to start with the one, Right? You have that choice today. Don't let that time slip away from your hands. The night cometh. You can just write that down as a law. It's coming. The night cometh when no man can work. Do your part. We're going, to be, we're going to sing, and after that, we're going to have some announcements. But, you know, God has spoken to us through His Son, and we have His Word. We've had preachers come this week, and they've preached His Word. They've given us exhortations out of His Word, and He has spoken. Uh, if you've been touched, if you've been uh, being dealt with by God through His Word, if He's dealing with you in some area... You need to answer. It's very important. God wants you to answer. And so while we sing this, just think about that, that call of God, what he's dealing with you this week. What has he been, been uh, doing in your life? And if you need to, you need to answer God. You can do it right there in your seat. You can come up and, and pray. You can just, just talk to God, yes. speak to God, yes. respond to him because he is calling Let's sing number 58.
Have you given him your all? Is he your master? a great conference. Yes. <laughs> it's a great conference. A good week. You know, uh, I want to say that we are grateful, grateful to all the missionaries that have come. Thank you for the words. Thank yep. you for your preaching. Thank you for, you know, leaving uh, your, your work to be able to come here and, and be with us for a while. Um, it's, a, it's really a blessing. Thank you for all the effort that you've put into it. Thank you also for for all the workers here in the church, everything you've done, the, the cooking, the, the organizing, the cleaning, the nursery, the, the, I mean, it's just a lot of work, and we thank you for, for being here. We thank you for coming. It's really a, a good thing that, you know, take time after a hard day's work, come to the meetings, then get up in the morning and come and talk and fellowship at night. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it, and, and you know, it's a great thing, and thank you all for everything Thank you for what you've done. And for the offerings, as you know, offerings have been closed. But you can continue supporting these missionaries. Amen. It's not like it's closed forever. You can continue supporting them monthly Amen. because they're out there preaching the word. Amen. And you know what? If you can't do that all day here, you can support somebody that can. And so it's worth the while. So, hey, uh, continue giving to missionaries. You can you can participate in their mission. Now, uh, the mission expenses have been all paid for, for the missionaries. Everything that, that, that they had to do to be able to come, that was all paid. And above that, there was a love offering that came in of $13,688. And so that's a great blessing. This is to being divided up uh, amongst the, the preachers here. And we just, we just thank you for the love offering that was given. Praise the Lord that he allows us to do this. And, and Lord, we're giving, we're giving what you've given us, right? So thank you. Thank you for all that. Um, I would like to ask everybody to just close your eyes and bow your heads real, real quick. I want to ask a very important question. And um, I, I want you to think about this. If anybody here is not saved, if you do not know what is happening with you when you die, if you're fearful of death and what comes next, you don't know what's going on, and you need to be saved, go ahead and raise your hand. Just, just say, hey, I'm not saved. I, I, I want somebody to talk to me. I, I need to know. Go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll be able to talk to you afterwards. Okay. Go ahead and open your eyes. Um, right now, at the end of the conference, you know, we like to give an opportunity to respond and uh, to respond publicly to, to the Lord's calling. I mean, your Christian walk should be a private thing. It should be something that you live uh, with God every day, day to day, privately, with nobody seeing. That should be there. But all, every once in a while, you know, it needs to be public. And God gives us opportunities to respond to Him publicly to announce you know, our commitment to him. And so we do like to give this opportunity at the end of the mission conference to, to publicly express your commitment to something that he's been dealing with you on. And so this is the first thing is just going to be a very general, general 
We're not calling anybody, you know, we're not, we're not saying you are stepping up to, to be called to the mission field. <laughs> this is just, just we want to know, if, has God spoken to you through this mission conference? Has he been dealing with you in some area of life and he's gotten your attention and he said, hey, I want you to do something. I'm, I'm trying to get something done. And you're, you've, your eyes were open and you're saying, hey, I want to respond. I want to I do something for the Lord. If the Lord has actually touched you through this mission conference with this preaching and you want to just respond and say, hey, I do want to I do want to do something for the Lord. Go ahead and stand up and just. Just show your, your, your commitment publicly. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. May, may we serve the Lord and, and respond adequately. Thank you. You can go ahead and be seated. Now, this is very specific. If God has been dealing with you, if God has used these messages, if he's used his word to to show you and, and, and reveal to you that you are needed in the mission field and that other nations need to hear the gospel and you want to take part in that and you want to go to the mission field. You want to go to another nation and preach the gospel. You want, to, you want to take place in this service and God has shown that to you and you want to respond to that. This is your chance. You can go ahead and uh, stand up and make that commitment also. Uh, Publicly. Anybody here today? Amen. It has been a good conference. The Lord has been dealing with us. And we do want to respond to the Lord's calling. We're going to go ahead and end uh, tonight. I would like to ask Grandpa, could you lead us out in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your moving upon our hearts. Rejoicing your people. Lord, we thank you for all the prayers you've answered and Amen. the blessings you've been. We thank you, Lord, that you hear us. It, it's amazing to me that you would even want to hear us. Thank you. But I thank you that you do. Amen. And Lord, we do want to give you praise and thanksgiving for your blessings yes. throughout this week and move upon our hearts yes. that will change us to the way that we can do a better work Amen. in the year to come. Bless all these missionaries. Bless everyone Amen. that's spoken. Uh, give them the desires of their heart. Use them. Yes, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. You can stick around in fellowship. <laughs> Keep Amen. having a good time. Thank you, Lord. What a good conference we've had.